Great. Wonderful. Again, thank you for coming and welcome to Wildlife Wednesday with our Southeast chapter. So just while everyone's jumping on here, I do encourage that folks keep their mute on and their video off, and that will help to uh, help with the bandwidth during the presentation and it'll prevent distractions. And uh, I also suggest that you view the presentation in your speaker view, and that'll really help to uh, view the entire presentation, all the photos, everything in its glory as it's supposed to be seen. And if you have any questions, please throw them into the chat. We will get to them at the end of the presentation. The last 10 to 15 minutes are devoted to questions and answers. So um, throw them into there and we will address them towards the end. And most importantly, we just hope you have a good time with this presentation, that you learn something new and that you uh, share it with someone you know, something that you've learned tonight. Give me a second, my slides. Just hit a bit, a bit of a lag. Great. So, again, this is a, a free presentation to the public, thanks to our members. And we thank you so much for being members with the Alaska Wildlife Alliance. Uh, we've been around since the 70s and have a strong community. And if you're interested in joining our team, um, join our pack, I should say, uh, I can throw that information into the chat later on. And as I mentioned, this is part of our Southeast chapter in this presentation. So we have three chapters throughout the state. Um, one is informal, but we do have a Kenai Peninsula Wildlife Wednesday. We have a Southeast chapter Wildlife Wednesday, and we also have an Anchorage Wildlife Wednesday. Um, that, and that one covers entire statewide topics. But tonight we'll be focusing on work being done in the Southeast part of the state. So AWA has three different tiers of work that we focus on. We have citizen science, education, and advocacy. And we do some beluga whale monitoring in the spring and fall. That'll actually be starting up here in a few weeks. If you're interested, you can visit akbmp.org to learn more. And we do a lot of education. We do tabling in the summers. We do wildlife walks as well. And in the winters, we have these Wildlife Wednesdays. And if you're in the Southeast, perhaps you've seen our signs to be bear aware and coexist well with bears in the Southeast. Um, those signs are on the new electric bus system that are down in Juneau. And some advocacy work that we're doing. Uh, we closed up for comments early in January on proposing trap setbacks, 50 yard trap setbacks off of popular trails in the Matsu Basin. And that went to the Board of Game and is still in the works. So we'll keep you posted on that in a few weeks. And we also, in the fall, filed a lawsuit to protect Beaufort Sea polar bears. And a lot more work can be done or can be seen on our website uh, at akwildlife.org slash lawsuits if you're interested in the advocacy side of what we're doing. Uh, some news. This is just a quick snippet from our website of what we've been doing in the last few weeks. Um, as I mentioned, our trap setback proposal to the Board of Game, and we've had our vice president on our board get published in a couple of different articles, including uh, climate change resistance, um, and also with exploring some invasive species dispersal in Alaska. And we also have been part of a group that is urging beluga whales to um, be even better protected within the state of Alaska. And so if you're interested in some of that, you should check out our website as well. Some upcoming events that I want to point out for folks, we do have Wildlife Wednesdays in a couple of weeks or next week and the following week. They are every first, second and third Wednesday of the month until April. And we also have a climate adaptation workshop just in a couple of weeks. And that is free and it's open to the public. It'll be in the mornings and it's going to be covering the resist, accept direct framework towards climate change, uh, especially focusing on wildlife in the state of Alaska and how to approach um, some new, I guess, techniques of addressing wildlife facing climate change and how to support them. So if you're interested, I will throw that, that link into the chat and some past or current events. 
uh, Wildlife Wednesdays, they are always recorded, as I mentioned, to and posted to our website or YouTube and our Facebook page. If you want to see our past ones, you can look there. Uh, we're also the featured charity for Blue Market, which is a zero waste uh, market in Anchorage. So for January through March, their first quarter of the year, they are giving us some proceeds back. So if you shop at Blue Market, you will be supporting the Alaska Wildlife Alliance. Some wildlife walks are going to be starting up this summer. Be on the lookout for those. And we also have our wildlife calendars, which feature some stunning images from, from local photographers that uh, were voted on by the public and they won and are now on our calendar. So if you want to see some diverse wildlife every day of the year, you can purchase our calendars online. And if you're interested in becoming a member, there's that link there. I'll also throw it into the chat. And again, thank you to our members for making these presentations possible. And if you're interested in supporting AWA in some other ways, you can check out those opportunities listed in those little icons below. And that is it. I'm going to hand it off to Dr. Cindy Trevuzio, and she'll be getting us rolling on Come to the Shark Side, getting to know Alaska's sharks. Very exciting. Okay, here we go. Um, so I assume you guys can all see this. Um, and please let me know if you uh, are unable to view anything or if there's anything weird that pops up. As of right now, I'm seeing the AWA logo, so I'm not sure what you guys are all seeing. But uh, we are calling today's talk, Come to the Shark Side, Getting to Know Alaska's Sharks. And normally I'm the queen of the nerdy references, but I get to give this credit all to Sabrina. She was the creative force on this fun title for this one. So it's just, this talk is broken up into three segments. First, we're gonna talk about what are sharks. Um, and then we're gonna talk about the sharks that are within Alaska. And then so, so, uh, zero in on some really, really amazing tagging research that's going on. So the word sharks actually spans a very large diversity of creatures. Um, the term sharks, normally when you hear the term sharks, you think of these typically torpedo shaped, uh, toothy grin, pointy nose, sleek things that zoom around in the ocean. And um, these are all not cartilaginous. And they, there's about 500 species of what we consider the typical sharks, and we'll call them true sharks for the uh, purpose of this discussion. However, they, again, the name of the game with the word sharks is diversity. There's other oddball species that are also true sharks. Um, these are flattened sharks, such as the angel shark families. In the case here, um, what's in the, what, what the identifying feature is that the gills here are on the side of the head and that these pectoral fins are not attached to the side of the head. Similarly, this is a saw shark, not to be confused with the saw fish, which also you see the gills on the side of the head, the pectoral fins are located behind the gills. The next group are the batoids, and there's about 650 species or so, and new ones being identified pretty much every day, it seems like. And these are what we call the flat sharks. Uh, these are dorsal ventrally flat. The identifying characteristic is this that meeting is being recorded. The pectoral fins are continuous with the head, so they're attached to the side of the head, and the gills are actually located underneath the head. And this is the one here. This is a saw fish, and these are the ones that actually get really large. You see pictures of them in um, out of Florida, the large tooth sawfish. They get very large, um, up to like 10, 10 to 12 feet long. These are all part of the batoid family. And then there's this oddball group called the chimerids, and these are a small number of species called, um, they include the ratfish, um, and there's only about 49 of these species, and they're just kind of this oddball species that fits into the categories. Within Alaska, um, we have a lot of ocean compared to other regions of the United States, and this map shows the federal waters within Alaska compared to other federal waters around the country in the different regions. And you can see that Alaska here in this blue is substantially larger than all the other areas. 
However, even though we have this giant area, we have zero directed fisheries for sharks. And there's been almost none throughout all of our history. Um, sorry, it seems that like people are hard, having a hard time hearing me. Um, Hi, Cindy. Yeah, would, would you be able to maybe move closer to your mic? That might help a little bit. My microphone's my camera. <laughs> oh. <laughs> we'll zoom in real close. Is that better? Uh, <laughs> not. Sorry. Oh, I was just saying, yeah, it sounds really warbly, kind of like you're talking through water. Oh, dear. Uh, I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> it does sound a bit better uh, now that now that you're closer. Okay. Maybe it's the aquarium behind me causing warbly sound. Um, if that is not making it better, I can try logging out and logging back in. So. Okay, I think you should be know. good. Yeah, you should be good for now. Um, okay. That, that seems well, to you get, close, you get a close up of me now. <laughs> <laughs> Your presentation is so captivating. We won't worry about it. <laughs> so as I was saying, we have, uh, there, ha there are currently no directed fisheries for any of the, uh, the shark species, shark state or batoid species within Alaska waters. There have been a few small scale directed fisheries in back in time. Um, the biggest being uh, the vitamin A fishery in the late 40s, which occurred after World War II. And this just focused on usually spiny dogfish livers, occasionally sleeper sharks, but this was a liver fishery where they rendered the oil for the vitamin A supplements. Um, there have been some fisheries down in British Columbia and Washington that were directed fisheries for the, the actual meat, but those, uh, they lost their market value. And so those just became non-profitable and they stopped, those shut down within the last decade. So, um, by and large, you just aren't directed to shark fisheries in the eastern North Pacific. So for an Alaskan federal fisheries, we assess the stock status every two years for these sharks. And overall, the sharks are considered data limited and they kind of run the spectrum between severely data limited to somewhat data limited. The true sharks that we're going to finish the talk about are generally severely data limited. However, none of these are considered conservation concerns. Our stock assessments have them all in the not overfished, no overfishing is occurring status. Um, the International Union of Conservation of Nature, which I probably got that acronym wrong, the IUCN, um, every year or few years, they assess species at a global scale and determine uh, what the status of that species is globally. And so they've determined that all of our species are either data deficient or at least concerned. However, one of our species did pop up to near threatened just a few months ago. It doesn't actually change anything. It just means they added a new data metric. And after reading through all their assessments, it just means they added a new data metric and they have a little bit more information, but nothing actually has changed with regarding the status of that species. So within Alaska, we have about 30 state species or the batoids, and we're not going to talk about those for the rest of this talk. We are going to focus on the true sharks, and we assess these in three species, and then we also have a catch-all group called the other sharks. And we have about 10 of those other shark species. Um, there we go. We have a blunt-nosed six-gill shark. Broadnose seven gills, brown cat sharks, basking sharks, blue sharks, and there's even been uh, great white sharks seen and spotted um, in Alaskan waters. This was just out of Yakutat um, early 2010, I want to say 2011. And they were able to get, uh, the shark came right up to the side of the boat with this halibut and they were able to see it. Just nobody got a pictures, but based on the bite radius, everybody believes that was a great white shark, definitely not a salmon shark. Recent additions to the list are uh, fresher sharks, which we only recently identified in Alaskan waters when we started doing surface trawl surveys in Southeast Alaska. So those are new additions to the list, as well as soup fin sharks, which I haven't added here. Um, we've had one soup fin shark now reported um, in electronic monitoring fisheries uh, in Southeast Alaska as well. 
The three species that we manage as individual species are the salmon sharks, the Pacific sleeper sharks, and the spiny dogfish. So I'm going to focus on these three species for the remainder of my portion of the talk. The Pacific sleeper shark is a very large species, and these are actually surprisingly common in near shore waters in Alaska. If anybody's in Juneau, I've had reports of them being caught off Portland Island, even right out of Ock Bay. And these are commonly caught by halibut longliners. And, you know, it's similar in Prince William Sound and other places. They get quite large, and we are extremely, this is our severely data limited species. Um, basically, all of the biological data we have comes from a very small number of animals caught in stall surveys, because that's the only time we get them on deck and actually have people who can touch the animal and look at it. And amazingly, we have zero records of adults. Even these giant ones in these pictures are likely either not adults or we're not uh, open to check. So with these species, we have a lot more questions than we do answers. There's, I think, one adult female in the entire history of literature for this species uh, from someone in California in the 1980s. There are a few limited records of very, very large species, very, very large animals of this species being seen on bait and drop cameras, like uh, Monterey Bay Research Institute, but there's no data associated with that other than there was this giant thing that ate up the entire camera. And because of its size, it's really hard for animals to study. If you catch one, you probably can't bring them on board. And so therefore, how are you going to dissect it? How are you going to collect any measurements? It's, it proves to be a very sick logistical and safety issue trying to get the users on this species. However, We've done it. We have managed to do some tagging work, and there is some ongoing work uh, with this, this species. And they're surprisingly active swimmers, even though they're called sleeper sharks. And research suggests that they have a very slow swimming speed. But this graph is a 48 hour depth track from one shark that was tagged in 2005, I think. And you can see that for that 48 hour period, it's constantly moving up and down, up and down in the water column even into quite shallow waters at night. And so that we think that this might be related to their feeding strategy because they're not they're not active swimmers, they're not really fast. They don't have great burst speed, but they feed on very fast swimming prey, such as uh, seals, salmon, and even squid. You know, we do know that they feed on uh, the whale falls and uh, carrion, so they're opportunistic but it, they also clearly feed on highly active prey that are still alive. And so given their coloration, they're possibly just like a, a, a lion weight cutter that swims around and waits and just grabs the food as it comes near it. Fully speculating, but um, they're a great mystery species. The spiny dogfish is our little shark with a large shark life history. And they get you know, four to five feet max and these are very common in coastal waters. They will um, oftentimes travel in large groups, packs. Um, they're a nuisance species to fisheries for sure. Um, they have no current market value and they, they roll up in the ears just as bad as the big sharks. And there's a lot more of them when, when you get into the schools and you're into the school of them. But they live to over 100 years and they're small. It's really amazing. Um, and they don't reach sexual maturity until they're 35 years old. And this species, to me, this is what I think is really amazing, is that this species is culturally significant to the Northwest Coast native Plunkett and Haida peoples. And the dogfish woman is a powerful symbol of transformation that they've enfolded into their culture for many years. And it's been adopted as a family crest even. The species is really slow. Everything about spiny dogfish is slow. Um, they have a very slow reproductive cycle with a 22-month pregnancy, and they have a very small number of pups. Um, I've seen a maximum of 22 pups. And so you combine that with taking so long to reach maturity, that means that the population itself is a very low productivity population. And this is our species that we have the most data on, um, and it's still pretty uh, low in the, the data deficiency spectrum. 
And then salmon shark is the last of the three species I'm going to tell you about. And this one is a close relative of the great white. This is our big charismatic species. And they are seasonally abundant in Alaska. They, there's been large congregations in Prince William's Sound documented um, and other places. And they tend to follow the, the prey. Uh, they, the schools of returning uh, salmon attract them in the, in the summer and the fall in Prince William's Sound. This species is endothermic, meaning it can maintain a body temperature higher than the water surrounding it. And in the family of sharks that it's in, being the great white shark, um, the makos, in this species, and to a certain extent the four beagle shark, the salmon shark has the greatest ability to maintain a warmer body temperature, so it can range farther north in this desert climate. And that means that they are very fast and acrobatic swimmers. They are active. But unfortunately, it also means that they, when you bring them on board, they come up fighting. They are, they are ready to go, and they do not want you to touch them. They don't want to be where you want them to be. They are extremely active, and you have to handle them in a very special way, at least especially when compared to the other two species I was telling you about, which are really easy to handle once you get them out of the water. But luckily with salmon sharks, they are, as their name suggests, they're designed to eat fish. So they have a small mouth, little tiny teeth, so even though in this picture, this person's leg is within that shark's mouth, he really only had a few puncture holes and it was not a substantial uh, bite wound. But they did learn, and the next year they had a cradle off the side. Found a much, much easier way of handling these uh, highly active swimmers. A salmon shark also have a pretty fascinating reproductive mode. And this is what drew me to salmon sharks. And, actually, this is what drew me into sharks in the first these guys. They are live bearing, but they are oophagous, meaning that the embryos eat eggs while they're gestating. And this is not the same thing as interuterine cannibalism that you hear about with sand tiger sharks. They are just eating yolks, basically. So if they've got these little cute little teeth, and it's from the moment they start to develop and they hatch out of this, is, this is called a candle, it's like a capsule around the egg. So they initially develop in this, and that little white dot in the middle is their first yolk sac. And when they pop out of that within the uterus, they start chomping on these guys, which are just nutritive yolk, nutritive eggs. And the female will ovulate a bunch of these, and that's what they feed on all through their uh, nine months of gestation, all through the development. And they develop this giant belly until they're ready to be born, and then they suck that, all that energy up, and they pop out like a ready-to-go little mini shark. And what's truly amazing is the female, like I said, ovulates just gobs of these eggs all throughout. And that's a lot of energy to do that. And she does it with one ovary. Uh, salmon shark and other lambid, actually, I think it's just salmon shark. That one I have to double check. They have one functioning ovary. And that's what this big lump here is. This other side that you would think would be the, the other ovary is actually part of this, this stretches back over this side it is called the epigonal organ which is, has nothing to do with reproduction and i assume you guys can see my pointer but i'm not sure um, but they have what's called a bifurcated uterus which means it's basically a u-shaped uterus um, it's got two sign two horns coming up and so in this case each side is chock full of little eggs and the females continuing to ovulate eggs to fill that up with the embryos to feed on. And you can see the little tiny ova getting ready to be ovulated at the top of that ovary there. And we know this is female was actively recently mating just based on these white wounds on her. And this was a female captured up in the Northern Bering Sea. This was many years ago, but it was late summer in the Northern Bering Sea. So there's a whole bunch of people collaborating on a lot of different research uh, within Alaska and on our various shark species. Um, a lot of physiology type stuff going on, aging, reproduction, diet, conservation and management, looking to improve the stock assessment, and looking at alternative methods for assessing these species. And also ecology, being where they go, why they go, where they go, and how are they doing and using tagging, which is what the remainder of this talk is going to be about. So I am going to hand over to Sabrina now. Um, 
Thanks, Cindy. Hopefully everybody can hear me. And I'm going to share my screen. And if hopefully everybody can see my presentation, thumbs up. <laughs> um, thanks, Cindy, for that introduction on sharks. So as she mentioned, we're going to start talking about salmon shark tagging or shark tagging in Alaska. Um, in the top left here, you can see Cindy uh, in action tagging a dogfish shark. And if you stick around for the whole talk, you'll get to see a full video of Cindy tagging a dogfish shark. So stay tuned for that. My uh, presentation doesn't want to switch here. Let's try that again. There we go. So we talked about shark tagging, but what exactly is shark tagging? Um, shark tagging is a research method that we use to learn about sharks. And the tag is the tool that we use to collect data in order to answer our research question. So while tagging, oops, some, seems like my, <laughs> I'm clicking, but it doesn't want to go. Let's try this. Let's see. There we go. So there we go. So the tag is, is the tool that we use to collect data to answer our research question. So tags typically fall into two general categories. The first are what we call conventional tags. And these are tags that can be visually detected um, without any specialized equipment. So this figure on the left shows a, um, a, what we call a spaghetti tag, and it's in a shy sharks uh, by their dorsal fin. And then this tag is a roto tag, and it's attached to the muscle of a spiny dogfish. And these tags are great because they are really cheap and easy to affix to a shark. But where these tags don't do very well is that you need to recapture the shark to get information about um, about, about the shark. And the information that you get from these tags is typically the location where the shark was tagged and then um, the, where the shark was recaptured. The second category are electronic tags. And electronic tags or satellite tags, they require special equipment um, to detect the tags. And while these tags are on the sharks, they can be, um, they're collecting data passively. And these tags are great because you never have to recapture a shark to get data. Um, and these tags, they collect really high, high uh, quality data on, on, um, on location, but they can also get great data on depth, temperature, and um, uh, a shark's speed and their orientation in the water. <laughs> Sorry, everyone. I'm We've got too many, too many screens here. There we go. So these electronic tags, they, you can see one on a mako shark, um, and you can see that the antenna is pointing up. So when the shark's fin comes, breaks the surface, the antenna will send a location to satellites passing overhead. And here on this Greenland shark, you can see, hopefully you can see my cursor, um, there is a tag affixed right behind its dorsal fin, and it's got another tag affixed um, right in front of the dorsal fin. So I'm going to talk about two tags that we use um, in a lot of the research that we do here in Alaska. The first are called pop-up satellite tags. Uh, these are PSATs for short, and these tags record data for a user-specified amount of time. So if a shark researcher is interested in how a shark acts after they've been caught in fishing gear, they might want to program these tags to collect really high, highly detailed data for a short period of time, say two or three months. Um, but if a researcher is more interested in their long distance migrations, they might program these tags to go for six months or up to a year. Um, and as, as you can see, these tags are usually affixed either to in the shark's back, in their muscle or on their dorsal fin. And once these tags reach their pop-off dates, they'll float to the surface and they transmit their data um, to, sat to satellites and then we can download that data. And the cool thing about these tags is that while they're, while they're attached to the shark, they're collecting really highly detailed data, but when they transmit data through satellites, they're, they're 
they're sending a portion of that data. So they'll send binned data maybe by hour, by the day. But if you can physically recover the tag, you get access to all that high, that really detailed data. And then the second tag that we use quite a bit are satellite transmitting tags. And these tags are great because they are sending a location, that shark's location, every time that that shark is at the surface. So these tags are more useful for sharks that spend a lot of time at the surface. So something like a tiger shark or a great white. And the tagging technology has been continuously improving year after year. And these tags can now last for a few years. So they give us a great tool to be able to collect migration data for, for over three years. So we can look for patterns year to year. Um, but with these tags also comes a price tag. And, and the more data you want these tags to collect, the more expensive they become. So while, while there's some tags that can collect just location, um, they, there's some more advanced tags that will also collect location, depth, temperature. Um, and as you can see on this tiger shark, the tags are affixed to the dorsal fin and with the antenna pointing straight up. So when that shark's fin comes um, out of the water, that antenna can get a clear shot of the sky and send a, a location. So what can we learn from tagging sharks? We can learn about their migration patterns. So we can learn where they go throughout the year and see if they're going to certain spots seasonally. We can look at their habitat use and their preference. So do sharks, um, are there certain temperature ranges that we find them in? Are they, are they more likely to be in coastal habitats or oceanic habitats? Um, if, there's, if they're exhibiting site fidelity, which means that they're visiting the same places year after year. So are they going to the same places to give birth? Um, we can also look to see if they're overlapping with fisheries or with protected areas. And we can also um, do some opportunistic sampling. So while shark tagging might be the primary goal, um, while we have the shark on the deck, we might wanna get a length measurement. Uh, we wanna get the shark sex. And then we also will take tissue samples like a fin clip or um, a muscle sample for genetic analysis or for some stable isotope analysis. So, you know, while we have the shark, we wanna get as much information as we can. So now I wanna talk about a few research projects that we have going on. Um, the first one is on spiny dogfish. And uh, Cindy and her collaborator, Julie Nielsen, have been putting these tags out on spiny dogfish sharks since 2009. And they have recovered 154 tags. So you might remember that these PSATs, you can see the spiny dogfish on the left has its PSAT and it's ready to go back in the water. Those tags are collecting really detailed data, but they're only able to transmit portions of that data via satellite. But if you can get your hands on that tag, you can get access to all that high quality data. So that's really great that you know they've got a lot of that data. Um, in that map on the left, you can see all the pop-up locations. So these are the locations where the tag actually popped up to the surface and sent a transmission. So those are shown in yellow boxes. And you can see that a lot of those pop-ups occurred um, along coastal habitats. And a few of them are, um, hopefully you can see my cursor, lots on the coastal habitats, a few in the Gulf of Alaska. But I want to point <laughs> your attention to this one tag that popped off the coast of Russia. Um, as Cindy said, these sharks get a maximum of 1.3 meters. So, you know, a little over five feet. Uh, so it's pretty impressive that this shark swam across the North Pacific and popped up in Russia. Um, the other thing I wanted to point out is that in this figure, uh, spiny dogfish sharks, their range extends into the Bering Sea, but there weren't any tags that popped off in there. So that's pretty interesting. And so with these tag data, um, Cindy and her collaborators are going to look at some ecological and behavior analyses and use these data to inform assessment and movement models. Uh, this figure here on the right just shows another, another way that you can visualize these data. So um, we've got the Aleutian Islands here, Kodiak, uh, Kodiak, the Kenai, and going down the coast of California. And these red, red areas on the map just show areas where are the high usage areas. So when you combine all the tag data, uh, these are the areas where we're most likely to see spiny dogfish. So you can see um, some red areas just south of Kodiak and then off the Western US coast. The next project I wanted to highlight is uh, on Pacific sleeper sharks. So this is an ongoing project. Um, and this is another collaboration with, um, with NOAA and Wildlife Frontier Technologies and the university. And you can see a video of a Pacific 
a sleeper shark in a sling. And like Cindy mentioned, um, they are really nice and easy to work up because they're pretty sluggish when they're being, be, being uh, worked up, which is great. Um, and you can see hopefully in the video, he's got some tags. Uh, he's actually got three tags and each of those tags are programmed to collect different things. Um, and off he goes. So this, this project is uh, taking place in Seward and Prince William Sound. And they've tagged seven Pacific sleeper sharks so far. And they're trying to put out tags mostly on larger individuals. Um, as Cindy said, we don't really know a lot about the larger ones. Um, and the point of these studies is to see what kind of prey these sleeper sharks might be getting at. And we can also get information on if these sleeper sharks are moving into the Bering Sea. So um, right now, these studies are happening, like I said, in Seward and Prince William Sound. But we know that sleeper sharks are caught in the Bering Sea. And knowing whether sharks in Seward and, and the Bering Sea are, are part of the same group or a different group is really important information for um, assessing this species. Um, and I mentioned previously that if you get your hands on the tag, you can actually get some detailed data. And one of the sharks that they tagged had, um, uh, one of the things that it measured was, is the shark's orientation. And so um, luckily this tag washed up on the beach and they were able to retrieve it and download this orientation data. So on, the, on this figure, there's three axes, the Y axes, the X axes, and the Z. And what I want you to take away from this figure is that during this time period, none of those axes are overlapping, which means that the shark is swimming as it should be swimming um, in the water column. So everything, happy shark. But at some point, you'll see that I've zoomed in on a section of this, of this tag history. And over the course of five minutes, this nine foot Pacific sleeper shark was inverted multiple times. And then, whoop, and then the tag went to the surface. So I'm just curious if anyone knows what could invert a nine foot sleeper shark multiple times. And if anybody guessed orcas, you are correct. So I'm sure folks have heard about resident killer whales that primarily eat fish and transient killer whales that primarily eat marine mammals, but there's also offshore killer whales which specialize in sharks. Um, in that top left photo here, you can see a killer whale with a salmon shark in its mouth. Um, we've got a few here in this bottom photo with a tiger shark, uh, but eating sharks comes, comes at a bit of a price. This um, image of this older killer whale shows what happens to their teeth after dealing with that really sharp or that really sandpaper like shark skin. So the last project that I wanted to talk about is a project that Cindy and I and others at the university are working on and that focuses on salmon sharks. Um, and Cindy gave a really great overview on salmon shark biology, um, but I wanted to just give you guys another, a, another little primer. So these sharks are apex predators and they're distributed from Japan up into the Bering Sea and down to California. And you can see that in red on this map. And as Cindy mentioned, these sharks are endothermic, so they can keep their internal body temperature elevated relative to the, to the waters that they're swimming in. And like Cindy said, these sharks um, of the other lamnid sharks, so the white sharks and the mako sharks, these salmon sharks are, are the most endothermic, which is, which is why they can be in the really cold waters here in Alaska and the Bering Sea. And another thing, these sharks, um, we don't really know much about their population structure. So it's possible that in the North Pacific, there might be two populations of salmon sharks, one's on the Western North Pacific and the others on the Eastern North Pacific, but we don't really know. Um, and, shark, and salmon sharks, like other shark species, um, they tend to separate by size and by sex. So what that means is that males might hang out in certain areas and females in others and smaller sharks will, be, will hang out in, um, in different areas than larger sharks. So a lot of the salmon shark tagging efforts that have happened in Alaska have primarily happened in Prince William Sound, Alaska, shown in that blue star on the map. And these sharks primarily migrated, migrated between Prince William Sound and um, off the coast of California. So they mostly spent their summers in Prince William Sound feasting on salmon. And then once fall and winter rolled around, they migrated south. A few of these sharks did end up staying in the Gulf of Alaska year round, but most of them exhibited this north-south um, migration. 
none of the sharks that they tagged as part of these research efforts ever crossed the date line. So that means none of them tagged in Prince William Sound moved over and crossed into the Western North Pacific. And then another interesting thing is that most of these sharks, all but one, um, they're all female sharks. So this again goes um, to what I said, where these sharks, um, females tend to hang out separate from the males. So we have a lot of really amazing tag data from these salmon sharks, but we have that information just for the females. So as part of my job, I get to go out on salmon shark or on salmon surveys in the Northern Bering Sea. Um, and from those surveys, when we're targeting salmon, we accidentally catch salmon sharks. And so we take advantage of those, <laughs> of those captures and we've started to opportunistically tag these sharks um, during these salmon surveys. And you can see in the top figure, um, and you can see the, the surface trawl net that we use to fish for, um, for salmon. And then in the bottom, you can see what the salmon sharks look like when they come on the deck. So like Cindy said, they're pretty energetic. They don't want to be there. Um, and so they're a little bit harder to tag than something like a Pacific sleeper shark. Um, on the right of on this map are all the locations where we've caught salmon sharks during these salmon surveys. And in the dots are blue for males, pink for females, and gray for if the shark wasn't assessed for sex. And what I want you to notice is that most of the sharks that are caught in the Bering Sea are males. And so we have this really big wealth of information on females tagged in Prince William Sound, but the Bering Sea gives us an opportunity to learn about male salmon sharks, which we really don't know much about. So from these efforts, we've currently tagged three male salmon sharks. So you can see them, um, shark A on the top, shark B in the middle, and shark C um, on the bottom. And they were all tagged with um, pop-up satellite tags and the satellite transmitting tags. And so the pop-up tags, they are gonna collect data on depth, temperature, and light um, for a year, and then pop off and send that data um, via satellite. And then the satellite transmitting tags are gonna stay on the shark for three years and they're gonna send really nice high quality location data um, until the battery dies. Um, so right now we've got shark B is still transmitting. He's on his third year. So um, I'm hoping that he, his, his uh, tag lasts a little bit longer. And shark C was just recently tagged um, in September, 2021. So hopefully we'll get a few, we've got a few years of, of his data coming up. So I wanted to show you what the data from these tags looks like. So this is a map of shark A, um, who was tagged in 2017. And the, each of these locations is a daily location and it's color coded by month. So hopefully you can see my cursor. This shark was tagged just uh, west of Nunavak Island where he traveled south and then across the North Pacific, whoops, across the North Pacific and then hung out off the west coast of the US. And then in July, he kind of decided he was done and he made his way straight back to the Bering Sea. And so if I calculate the distance traveled between each of those locations, this shark swam approximately 11,700 miles, which is already impressive, but that, the, that calculation only accounts for the distance between those surface locations. So it doesn't account for any of the swimming the shark did under the surface. So we know that it swam way more than 11,700 miles, which is amazing. And so this is what the data from those pop-up satellite tags looks like. So these, um, these tags collect depth and temperature, which I'm showing here. Uh, depth is here on the X axis with zero being the surface. And then each of those points is colored by the temperature. And what I wanna point out is the range that this shark, the range of temperatures it experienced. So these really light dark blue um, dots here, they're about 39 degrees Fahrenheit. And then these really dark red are about 68 degrees Fahrenheit. So that the range that this shark can be at is just a, you know, just goes to show what endothermy can do for these sharks. Um, and then I just wanted to point out the amount of time that these sharks are spending throughout the water column. So you can see with all these points that are at the zero mark that these sharks are at the surface quite a bit, but they are traveling up and down throughout the, to the water column almost continuously. And what was really cool is that in January and February when that shark was off the coast of California, 
those the water at about 100 meters was was quite warm and you can see that during that time that shark didn't visit the surface so it makes me think that these temperatures were about the upper extreme of what that shark wanted to be in and then this is the same map that I just showed for shark A, but this is shark B's migration. So the shark was tagged in 2019. And same thing, each of those dots is a daily location and it's colored by the month of the year. And so this shark was tagged just south of St. Lawrence Island um, up in purple. And this shark traveled straight south and then it made its way over to this underwater mountain chain called the Emperor Seamount. And this underwater mountain ridge, it, it extends down to Hawaii. Um, and the shark spent quite a bit of time here. And then he meandered over into the central North Pacific where he roamed around a little bit. Um, and then in about June, he looked like he was making his way back to the Emperor Seamount area, but then he took a, a sharp turn north and he made his way back to the Bering Sea. So about the same time as that other shark in, a, in July, both of these sharks returned to the Bering Sea. And then I wanted to show because these satellite transmitting tags give us the ability to see these sharks migrations over multiple years, I wanted to show what this sharks year one, which is on the left and year two um, on the right, what his annual migration look like. And so these videos are just showing one year worth of location data. They have, they're colored by the same month. And you can see on the left is the is an animation of the map that I just showed. So he went down to that Emperor Seamount region, and then he hung out, you know, in the North Pacific, and then made his way back to the Bering Sea. But in his second year, he again went back down to that Emperor Seamount region. But then he just made repeat visits um, to the Bering Sea in the winter time, and then right back down to the Emperor Seamount chain, and then right back up again to the Bering Sea. So it just goes to show that. These, these migrations are changing year to year, but, but what's causing these different migrations year to year, we don't really know. So we've only tagged three sharks, but we're really hopeful that we're gonna continue these research, um, these tagging efforts. Um, and some of the things we've learned is that these sharks, even though they were tagged in the same area, they undertook very different migrations. So one shark stayed in the North Pacific for, for the entire winter before going back to the Bering Sea and one shark went all the way down to California before coming back to the Bering Sea. Um, both of these sharks spent a lot of time at the surface, but they also you know, utilized the entire water column up to 500 meters. Um, we saw some repeat visits to the Bering Sea and then also to the Emperor Seamount chain. So um, I wish we could put cameras on these guys and see what's making them go to, to, the, to those regions over and over again. Um, I'm guessing food, but it'd be really great to know you know, is what else could, could it be? Could it be um, meeting up with some female sharks? Um, for shark B, where we have multiple years of migration data, it was really interesting to see how those, those migrations change year to year. Um, and we've also learned that sometimes months go by where these sharks don't come to the surface. So I told you that we tagged three sharks and I didn't show you any data from the third shark. And that's because he hasn't come up to the surface since December. So, um, I've been checking my uh, my online satellite tool to see if uh, if he's come up to the surface, but no luck yet. Um, and I think the coolest part is that we still have so much to learn about these sharks. Uh, salmon sharks are charismatic megafauna, and so you'd think that you know we know all there is to learn about them, and that just isn't the case. So it's really exciting to 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 be a part of this work. Um, in terms of future re future efforts, we're going to continue to opportunistically tag sharks. So we've got a survey that's going on in the North Pacific. It actually just left today and I'll be out there in about two weeks. And four, three vessels are gonna be simultaneously sampling um, across the North Pacific. You can see it on the map. So um, I've put shark tags on each of those vessels. And so if they come across a salmon shark, they will be, um, they'll be tagging them, which will hopefully they catch them. Um, I'm also sending tags to some colleagues in Russia so the cool thing about the sharks that they catch in Russia, um, they catch them while they're doing pink salmon surveys in Kamchatka, but they're catching females and males, and they're also catching a, a, quite a range of sizes. So they're catching um, juvenile sharks and adult sharks. So um, collaborating with, um, with our colleagues in Russia gives us a chance to put some tags out on females outside of Prince William Sound and on, and on smaller sharks as well. 
And we're also going to pool um, genetic tissue samples from sharks collected in Russia, from Alaska and Canada, and see if we can figure out if sharks from the Western North Pacific and sharks from the Eastern North Pacific are genetically distinct and try to figure out if there are, um, in fact, one or two populations of salmon sharks in the North Pacific. So with that, um, Cindy and I would be happy to take any questions. Here is the video of Cindy tagging a spiny dogfish shark, which I promised. Um, our emails are on this slide and please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions. Um, just wanted to shout out to our collaborators of which there are many, but uh, the University Wildlife uh, Frontier Technology, uh, Kingfisher Marine Research. Um, for any of our, if there's a, any young folk on, on the line, the Gills Club is a great resource for learning about shark research around the world and getting in touch with female shark scientists. And if you wanna continue getting updates on the sharks that we've tagged, you can check out that Facebook uh, link at the bottom. So thank you all very much for, for inviting us. Thank you so much, Sarita and Cindy. Uh, that, wow, I am just blown away. You don't often get to see shark research at all or much less hear about it. Um, so this, to have videos and photographs that are just so cool. Um, very, very awesome. So thank you for sharing all that. Um, we do have several questions all lined up and they kind of bounce back and forth between Cindy and Sabrina. Uh, but I'll just start. One's kind of a general question. Is bycatch in commercial fisheries a concern for shark populations in Alaska? Okay, um, I can take that one. Uh, that's a no and maybe is the, the best answer I have for that. Uh, because there are no directed fisheries, all of the catch is bycatch. And um, there it's almost entirely discarded. So these are all nuisance species. They don't want to be caught. Uh, and for especially for like spiny dogfish, um, the catch rates are a lot lower than the estimated biomass. For the other species, we don't have enough information to say if it's a concern, but we also don't have any, we don't have information to say if it is or if it isn't a concern. So we try to manage ca with caution um, until we develop better assessments to, assess to answer those questions. Awesome. Uh, Cindy, did you say there's no data on adult sleeper sharks? Uh, the person said those photos of adult, of those huge sleepers were not adults, question mark, um, any info about age. So they looked very large, but they, were they not adults? Right, that is uh, exactly it. Uh, they, they get very large. And to the best of our knowledge, they don't reach maturity until they're somewhere in the neighborhood of 15 feet, um, you know, even you know, 3.6 meters. Um, that's again, to the best of our knowledge. So we don't actually have a good gauge on that. Uh, we rarely see animals that size, but the more I talk to fishermen, the more I find out that they are seeing them. We just don't have the records of that in our data. And the few times that people on surveys catch animals in that size range, they are really reluctant to uh, to kill the animal and dissect it because they are pretty rare and uh, nobody really wants to kill a 15 plus foot shark because I mean, geez. Um, and I think there was a question about aging. Um, so aging is a tricky thing. Um, we have been able to age spiny dogfish. We use the dorsal fin spine and you basically count the rings, like count tree rings. And that's been validated by using a bomb carbon, uh, you know, radiocarbon dating to make sure that that method is unbiased. So we we have a pretty good estimate of unbiased age for spiny dogs. Which that's how we know they, they can be over 100 years old. Pacific sleeper shark is a lot more challenging. Um, actually, let me do salmon shark first. Salmon shark are a little bit easier because uh, they have highly calcified vert vertebral centra. And so you can look at the center and again, count the rings along the, the, ver the you take out a chunk of the vertebrae, you dry it, and you can count the rings on it. Um, I don't know if that one's been validated or not, but they live in the range of 30 years. Um, then Pacific sleeper shark is the, is the hard one. We've tried a number of methods. We've tried all the standard staining, lighting, x-ray, all that stuff on the verte vertebral column and had no luck. There just aren't any banding patterns. 
So we're now trying a method that was uh, developed for mammals and then also used on the Greenland shark. And in 2016, a study came out um, where it looks at the, the core of the island and uses the radiocarbon dating on the core of the islands. Uh, and they found that they estimate that Greenland sharks could live in the neighborhood of 270 to 500 years old and not reach sexual maturity until 150. Uh, that's pretty outrageous and mind blowing. Uh, so we, there, you know, there's as all as with any study, there's a lot of caveats and things to think about in the lab methods and whatnot. We're attempting to use the same methods on sleeper sharks. Uh, we're just waiting for our funding to come in and to finish that. But we've done some pilot work showing that uh, a 10 footer that we were able to sample was somewhere between 35 and 50 years old, not anywhere close to being reproductive yet. I mean, uh, you know, I, pulled, I, I dissected that one myself, and there was absolutely no chance that that animal was anywhere near reproductive maturity. Um, so I think that answered a couple questions at one time. Yeah, I think that answered several of them, but wow, that's amazing. Um, wow, amazing. Uh, let's see here, next question. Uh, Sabrina, regarding satellite tags, how frequently do shark do sharks break the surface with their dorsal fins? Gotta unmute myself. Um, for the salmon sharks, it, it's different by the individual. So, you know, I showed shark B, which we tagged a few years ago, and he's coming to the surface almost every day. Um, so he's been really great because I'm getting really nice location data from him. Um, that shark that we just tagged in September of 2021, um, he was, coming up to the surface almost daily and then December hit and he hasn't come up since then. Um, so for, you know, this, this, that amount of time, you know, it's almost, oh, it's about two months. And so I was getting worried that maybe something happened to him, um, but he still has his PSAT attached. And those um, archival tags, they, the ones that pop off, they have a mechanism that if the shark is at a, a, a depth constantly for more than three days, it tells the tag that that shark probably died and will pop off the, the shark so that we can get whatever data it's collected until then. Um, but that shark's tag hasn't popped off yet. So I'm hopeful that he's just under the water, you know, living his best shark life and hasn't come up to the surface yet. But I'm checking every day because I'm, I'm really excited to see where he is. Um, but yeah, the salmon sharks are a great, um, model for these satellite tags because they are coming to the surface so frequently um, for something like a Pacific sleeper shark, we're probably not going to fit them with a satellite tag because they're not coming up to the surface hardly at all. But those archival tags that are attached to them are still going to be able to collect really nice depth, temperature, um, speed, orientation data. Uh, speaking of that, there was a question regarding depth and temperature. So there's a diurnal migration from deeper to shallow perhaps would it be due to feeding and digestion yes there's been so from those females that they tagged in prince william sound they they got a bunch of depth and temperature data and what they found is that while a lot, the sharks spend a lot of time at the surface in the summertime um, once fall and winter rolls around they do end up going deeper but it, it was very variable among the individual. So in those, in those studies, they actually ended up coming up with four different behavioral classes because some sharks did exhibit diurnal behaviors, but others didn't. Um, and some of them did the opposite where they were shallow during the night, but then really deep during the day and vice versa. So um, they're not all doing the same thing. And I think that's why it's, it's really interesting because you don't, you know, with, with, with each shark, you're getting really cool cool individual data. Um, yeah. And could they be taking advantage of currents to conserve energy while traveling long distances? That's a great question. Um, we know that they, the, well, the sharks that I was, that we've been looking at, which is just a few, they tend to hang out in, in some, at like current fronts. Um, but I don't know if they're taking advantage of currents or if they're taking advantage of the food that's located where those two currents meet. Um, Cindy, do you have any insight on whether they're using currents to, to help their travels? You know, you would think they would, but 
pin half of the spiny dog that I tagged went against the Alaska Post. Uh, so maybe. <laughs> yeah. you know, I think that there could, there could be situations. Um, some of our, Julie Nielsen and I were speculating some of the dogfish tags, um, the dogfish that we tagged uh, spent some time in eddies, making use of the food available in eddies, which can bring um, colder deep water up. And so I would just say maybe. I'd say the jury's still out on that. Yeah, I would, th I would think that maybe a spiny dogfish would more than a salmon shark because salmon sharks are pure muscle, really strong swimmers. So I think they can hold their own pretty well. <laughs> All right. So we are at eight o'clock. We have two or three more questions. And I want to be respectful of everyone's time, speaker and presenter, um, but and also uh, those attending. So. Uh, if you guys want to stick on and answer those couple of questions, I welcome that. But if you have to take off as well, that is also fine. And you can provide some contact information that people can reach out to you with those questions if they didn't get answered. I can stick around for a few more minutes, but our emails are on the slide that's on the screen right now. So please always feel free to email with more questions for sure. Perfect. Yep. We'll, we'll get to what we can. Um, uh, the first of the last couple. So Cindy, the spiny dogfish photo, uh, the person could see the pups were the other items feeder eggs. Ah, yes, that's a great question. Um, so spiny dogfish don't do the OOKG like the, the salmon shark do. Um, that picture is a little misleading. I probably should uh, explain that better. So spiny dogfish pups feed solely on the one yolk sac that is attached to them. And in that picture, actually, maybe I'll bring that up. Sorry, I moved my screens around so I can see the things differently. Uh, there we go. So in this picture, if you're seeing it, somebody give me a thumbs up. <laughs> um, in this picture, each of these cups has a yolk sac attached to it. And judging by the size of it, they're probably three to four months away from, from uh, being born, from puppies. What's going on here is these are eggs that were dissected out of the ovary. Those are the eggs that are ready for the next pregnancy. And so what dogfish do, uh, most of them are developing eggs for the next pregnancy at the same time that the pups are developing within the uterus. So they're actually ready to roll over and just start another pregnancy like a month later. So they're basically a conveyor belt of babies. And the over, it takes four years from when the ovary eggs start developing to get to a pup that's pup ready to pup. So it takes two years for the eggs to get to about this size. And that's so a large, large golf ball size, um, size egg. So that's a lot of yolk and a lot of energy they put into that. And that is the only thing that the pups feed on throughout the gestation. Wow. Those are huge. <laughs> you think they about are it. huge. <laughs> and the small portion of the population actually uh, will take years, an unknown number of years off in between pregnancies. And it's easy, and we call it skip spawning. Really easy to identify the spiny dogfish because if they're going to skip spawning, the ovaries don't look like that. And um, that's actually a, a really challenging thing to identify in our Peleop species with the, you know, the small, very small ovaries that broadcast spawn a million eggs. Um, so skip spawning is easy in spiny dogfish. Yeah, wow. Incredible. Um, next question. Thank you for answering that. Um, what do you think about the sensational sensationalism related to sharks in the popular media, such as Shark Week and the Meg? Okay, I'll go first. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit of a loaded uh, question. <laughs> uh, I don't think Shark Week accurately represents shark science. Um, it's, I mean, the, it's in the question. Yes, it's sensationalism. It's trying to get rating. Um, they are starting to put more shark science in there. Um, but I think there's a, there's a lot of room to spread more accurate information. Sabrina? 
<laughs> yeah, definitely. Like Cindy said, there's over 500 species of sharks. And if you watch Shark Week, you probably wouldn't know that. Um, and there's a lot of a lot of research goes on on the you know big charismatic shark species, and there is a lot of stuff that we don't know about you know the other 490, and a lot we don't know about skates and rays. So um, yeah, I think there's a few sharks that get a lot of media coverage, and um, there's a lot of room for improvement. I would say for for Shark Week, um, I guess the only thing would be a positive, we, we've got to be a little positive. Um, at least it gets people to learn about sharks. And if it fosters their interest in sharks, um, then maybe people will be more keen on, on helping protect sharks. So we can share this Wildlife Wednesday recording and maybe they'll <laughs> spread it wide. But it, it does, it is nice to have the the attention on sharks and to bring in some of their, I guess, the positives of them versus just the Jaws picture that some people have. Uh, lastly, it's a question slash statement. So it sounds like each shark is an individual with its, with its own rather unique personality and behavior. Hmm. I'd like to, I'd like to think of it that way, but <laughs> yeah, the tag data definitely sounds like, yeah, definitely makes it seem like they're not all doing the same thing. Um, they're not all going to the same places. Um, and so, yeah, I, I, it's going to, it's hard to put them in a box and say all the salmon sharks caught in the Bering Sea are doing this. And Cindy, I, if you want to speak to your dogfish, cause you, you have a lot more an impressive data set with your spiny dogfish. So maybe you can speak to some of the patterns you see. stuff and you know taking a gross look at the data there's not one category that says this shark's going to go do that um, speaking to personality i used to work down in the seattle aquarium and a diver in their big underwater dome and they had a, a small school of dogfish every one of them had a different personality you could actually like identify their behavior so yes they do have personality believe it or not and i realize that sounds like anthropomorphizing because it hasn't been heavily studied, but there is actually a body of research of people studying the fact that sharks trip up can learn and integrate the knowledge they learn to do things, but they do have different personalities. And I mean, not to fully speak out, but I got one in a tank back here that you can't see, but we used to have more, and they would each one would behave completely different feeding times. Uh, they have very unique personalities, you know, like our dogs. Do. It's, Kind of amazing to think about it, but they you could have two of the same species, the same sex, the same size, and they're going to be completely different things. That is lovely, and I think that is an amazing note to end on. Um, I'm going to end the recording right now.